All right, so here we are. We're talking about the politics and economies in Latin America as part of uh, Chapter 38 and the end of Empire. Latin America is in a very interesting spot versus the other regions we've been talking about this in chapter in that the um, Latin American countries had been had their independence technically from Europe for over 100 years at this point. They still were really kind of subservient in the world economy, and we'll, we'll talk about that later. We're going to be bouncing around to a lot of countries like most of this chapter. We'll start in Mexico. Uh, the first leader we really need to talk about is uh, Cardenas. Uh, who's going to really um, move forward a lot of the of the things set out in the Mexican Constitution of 17, 1917. So he does um, a huge uh, amount of uh, redistribution of land. And what's going to end up happening is, is that um, in addition to this, his, his big thing that most people know him for is his nationalization of the oil industry to create Pemex. So what does nationalization mean? It means that a government takes control of an industry um, and so as you'd imagine when they do that that is not very popular with the people who own that industry so uh, it has the potential of being a huge blow up um, the the primarily american and british investors were very upset at this um, but again world war ii was right around the corner we talked about this previously so fdr basically kind of mulls this over kind of allows this to happen so that mexico is on the side of the allies um, now that's going to do that nationalization is going to be very helpful for some of the people throughout Mexico. And um, however, the organization that um, that Cardenas was a part of was basically in what was known for the longest time called the PRI. So, um, so basically, the PRI was in charge of uh, Mexican politics from uh, for uh, almost seventy-one years, if I remember correctly. And so. What that's going to lead to is what's interesting about that is that the PRI's different policies is going to kind of change over time just to maintain their, their power. And there'll be different times where they're more, more friendly to the United States or less or, um, you know, more exports or less exports. And eventually what's going to end up happening is uh, they're going to lose an election. The, the first kind of cracks in the corruption and what was happening with the PRI um, is really kind of seen internationally with the Chiapas. Uh, which is a, a district of Mexico that wanted their independence or at the very least wanted to be treated better. And eventually Vincente Fox is going to win the 2000 presidential election with the with PAN. And that's going to break the PRI's monopoly of the office. Uh, we're going to move down to Argentina. And Argentina is going to be uh, one of these cases where um, one of these examples of uh, you know, the military leadership we often see throughout Latin America. So uh, the big leader, which you need to know off the top of your head here, is Juan Perón, who is a, a nationalistic military leader, which we're going to see a lot throughout Latin America. And so uh, he promoted um, nationalist populism. So uh, kind of to support the working class, to be somewhat independent from foreign control, and to you know stroke a, a lot of national fervor um so one of the things that's going to help him is going to be his wife eva perone who is going to uh come from a really common background but is going to um is going to become a very famous soap opera actress so she's uh she's very beautiful she's incredibly charismatic and she is going to because of her background is really going to be endeared by the people of Argentina, not just because from where she was from, but from what she did. She is going to do tons of, um, of charity work for the poor and for the homeless. And people are just going to flock to see her and everything she's going to do to help people. Um, she is one of the reasons, or, or partially one of the reasons for her popularity, is also that she's going to die relatively young. She's going to die well, really young, in her early 30s due to, due to cancer. Um, so some people will bit, uh, basically elevate her to a saint. Um, others will not. They will, you know, think that she was basically kind of making sure the power was for her and her husband. Um, but she's going to be still an indelible memory and, and, and symbol for Argentina. Um, and... Again, this is going to lead, Peron will have power, uh, well, 
lose power than gain power, but Argentina will have a lot of these military dictators. Um, your book also talks about Guatemala and, Ar and Nicaragua, which are important because they're going to be big illustrations of how the United States in the Cold War is going to affect um, is going to affect the development in Latin America and how the U.S. is going to be involved. So um, you'll remember during this time period, the overriding foreign objectives of the United States is going to be the fight against communism. And it's important to note that, um, you know, to our detriment, what the United States is going to be, that the, the Cold War is, and communism is both a political and economic threat. And so if they have to choose between the two, the United States over and over and over again will um, side with the economics as, hey, if you're not going to have a democratic capitalist country, you at least need to be capitalist. And as long as you help us make money and uh, stay and keep down communism, then we'll let you be in power. So um, one of the things that happens is going to be in Guatemala, where uh, our Benz is going to be elected democratically elected in Guatemala, and he's going to run with this idea of, hey, taking back more power for the people of Guatemala, which includes in 53, the seizure of hundreds of thousands of acres from the United Fruit Company, which is a, a private company controlled mainly by U.S. investors. That, of course, is going to make um, those U.S. investors very angry. And what's going to happen is, is that uh, Arbenz, similar to kind of what Cardenas did with the nationalization of oil, is going to offer to to pay the company based off of how much um, how much he believed that land was worth. And the U.S., uh, those investors are, of course, going to say it's way too low. And the government, the U.S. government will basically enable our bends to be overthrown. So um, what will happen is President Eisenhower will be the first one to kind of really do this. And what's going to end up happening is, is we're going to have, um, they're going to train uh a non-communist but military military man, uh, Carlos Armas. Um, and what's going to end up happening is with the support of U.S. weapons and air, um, Castillo Armas is going to be able to just uh, to take over the government. Um, so again, this is kind of one of the issues is, is that um, the U.S. Is in, is, has this issue that they want to tamp down communism and they want to tamp down anybody who's going to um, who's going to try to, who's going to be against capitalism. And so, you know, you can either send your own troops, which is incredibly unpopular, or you can send weapons and training, um, which is what we do here in Guatemala. Now, the issue is over and over and over again, the issue is, is that what happens once the leader is overthrown, you can't take back the weapons. You can't take back the training. So what happens is, is that, um, you know, go figure, a military leader is assassinated. So Arm Armas is assassinated. And um, this basically leads Guatemala into a civil war that doesn't end until the 90s, um, as different military groups basically wrestle for control. The other place that we can really see this is, um, is in Nicaragua. And we've talked about this briefly with, um, with Somoza and Sandino. So Somoza is the one who uh, is the pro-U.S., um, is, is the pro-U.S., very anti-communist um, U.S. ally. And so what's going to happen is that that U.S. interference is going to be something that everyone in Nicaragua wants. And so there's going to be a movement led by Augusto Cesar Sandino, who, um, who's basically going to lead a, a guerrilla war against, um, against this, this U.S.-backed government. So... And there is going to be popularity behind this because of some of the of the corruption and the brutality of the Somoza family. Now, what this is going to do is even once they uh, even once they kill Sandino, his mission lives on, and it lives it lives on in the, in the idea of the Sandinista Front for Natural National Liberation, and, and in general, that's known as the Sandinistas here in the United States. So the thing is, is that. Um, even though they are going against what they consider a corrupt government there in Nicaragua, some of them are going to be avowed Marxists. And so that puts them on the wrong side of the Cold War. Now, what's interesting is that uh, pres the president in the late 70s, Carter, is going to start to relax some of the Cold War policies of the United States in Latin America. And so... Um, 
what's going to happen is that the U U.S. is going to stop just supplying people who are saying, "Hey, we gotta we gotta tamp down. We, we're we're trying to get rid of communists and socialists." So what's going to happen is is that Carter, even though Nicaragua had had decades of support from the United States, Carter withdraws that, and with that, the Sandinistas rise to power. And um, so this is a this is a big change. And the other change is during the presidency, Panama gets control of the Panama Canal, which obviously is a very important economic boost for them. Now, this momentary change in U.S. policy is not going to last very long because right after Carter is Ronald Reagan, who's very staunchly anti uh, anti communist. And to to his credit, for the reason why he was against this was because again the communism practiced by that we could see through China and North Korea and Russia were were very controlling and authoritarian. And so, what happened is is that uh, Reagan started to um, to try to back a group called the Contras, um, Contra against the Sandinistas. Now, the Congress gets upset about, you know, just these potential never-ending wars that are happening in Latin America. And so in 84, Congress imposes a two-year ban for any sort of military aid to the Contras. And so some of Reagan's administrators get um really uh, the most charitable thing I could say would be creative, but they go against that ban and create something, um, create a way to get more weapons to um, to these Contras, and they do it through a sale of arms to, of all countries, Iran. It's much more complicated. I don't have time to talk about it right now, but if you have more questions, let me know. So that's going to lead to what's known as the Iran-Contra affair, which is going to be a big scandal uh, in you know 86 and 87. And so this again, um, this again uh, leads to kind of a, a black eye to, um, to the United States on, on how they kept interfering in Latin America. And so one of the things that's going to happen is, 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 interestingly, the Sandinistas has to change and they get weakened and so on and so forth, but they basically maintain some control in Nicaragua. And again, that leads to... Um, but again, we, the Cold War kind of created this um, kind of hypocrisy in that the United States was against anybody who was communist. However, just because you were capitalist or were willing to be an ally of the United States didn't make them perfect or necessarily good. And so we see some really strange um, groups starting to rise up against kind of the U.S. efforts in this area, including um, different priests um, in Latin America. And the other thing that's really interesting to note is not just necessarily like the intersection of religion and freedom, but also the intersection of this revolutionary ideology and women. So we see this uh, most notably in Nicaragua. And so what happens is, is that um, many women start to see the idea, see this is a chance for women themselves to have a better, have a stronger role and a better role in their country. So the slogan, no revolution without women's emancipation, no emancipation without revolution. So there's an intersection of those ideas. And what that's going to lead to is that's going to lead to an expansion of women's rights uh, in voting and also in uh, the political uh, process in general. And that leads us to the last part of this section, which is talking about kind of the search for economic equity. Um, the big issue which is going to be talked about here is going to be how um, how a lot of the world is to beholden to a few countries. So there is a, uh, a, a famous Latin American economist, uh, Argentine to be precise, Raul Prebisch, who is going to, uh, like some others, is going to talk about this idea of the dependency theory, is that the way that the world was set up economically is that there were a few really developed industrial nations, primarily in North America and Europe, who basically um, were making all the decisions and making a lot of the money. And all the other countries, whether they were direct colonies or not, were kind of beholden. They were shut off into the periphery. And so these peripheral countries were having trouble maintaining, uh, great getting their own power because they were just kind of in the periphery of, of the world economy. And this is something that we're still working on today and we're still working on it and kind of back and forth is like how do countries who have been set up to be you know export economies 
how do they have their own freedom? Are they just always going to be dependent on, you know, the U.S. and Europe for for their prosperity? What about all the people who live there? If if that is causing the inequities within the country, how are they going to get the strength to be able to change that system if, you know, the U.S. and Europe wants the system in place so they can make the most money? And so back and forth, um, we'll, we'll talk about this more in, in the last heading, is this kind of push and pull behind, um, you know, capitalism might be the best economic system, but it might not be the best economic system for every country or for every person within every country. So um, so that's kind of the discussion which is still going on now. And that's the end of the section.